fish were there. See, we never fished the Kissimmee or nothing. We never fished anything. It had to be the worst sledge hole in the world. But, you know, <laughs> and um, I'm going to go back me up on some of that stuff. And uh, uh, anyway, Buck came down the next day. And uh, Buck and I were in one boat. And we stayed on the main lake on Lake Apopka. And he said, pick up the Gordon. And uh, we had prearranged to meet at the dock in Winter Garden uh, about 5.30. And we got there a little bit early. We didn't catch anything, Buck and I. And we waited for Vic, and Vic came back down to Gordon Neck and met us at the pier. And uh, Buck was laying down with his head over his eyes. And I think he was about ready to give up the ghost there because the place was in such terrible condition. And uh, he asked Vic what he caught. And Vic said he caught a little mess about that big. I was ready to strangle Vic because I figured <laughs> we'd be out there another month. <laughs> <laughs> Buck said, where did you catch that fish? Can you remember? And Vic says, yeah. Okay. Well, Buck says, take us there. So we got back in the boats and everything. We went up to Gordonek to this area that Vic found. We started trolling 500s. The deepest water, I believe, was about six or seven <coughs> feet where we were at. And uh, <coughs> there was what appeared to be an island off to the right. And every time I trolled past this island, I caught a little bass. I mean little now, I mean six to ten inches long. And Buck says to Vic and I, he says, they're here. I know they're here, they're here somewhere. So he said, let's move around to the inside and see if we see any deeper water in this big bay-like area. And what it was, the island was shaped like in a half moon like that. And there was an opening there. It had a bunch of lily pads and alligators sitting up on the shore, and some snake birds and stuff like that. And we couldn't cast spoon plugs because of the bottom condition. So he decided that we would use SJs to cast them. So Buck and I were anchored here in about, well, oh, water a little deeper than that. And Vic was anchored over to the side. And I threw toward the lily pads. And the line kept running off the reel. And I, thought, I told Buck, I said, I think I got one. And I yanked on it, nothing. So I let the line keep going. And I said, Buck, it's sinking. Kidding me? I said, no, I'm not. Well, when I got to the bottom, I hopped it. Um, it was on right then and there. The three of us were catching them. Buck was doing most of the filming, and uh, that was the first night. And um, I forget what we caught that night. We just caught a bunch of them, you know, and got it, most of it on film. A lot of good sized ones. And then a day passed, and then. Buck wanted to get Charlie Williams from the Chamber of Commerce out there, and Monroe Campbell, an outdoor writer for the Jacksonville Journal. So we had both of them guys out there with us. Vic was alone again in the boat. I was with Charlie, and Buck was with Monroe Campbell. And we went back in there. And Vic and I went in there first while they were fooling around out there drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. And they, they, the water was actually orange when the wind blew. Like you guys see green algae stuff and everything. This was orange from the orange groves. Pure orange. And uh, so Vic and I went in there and the wind was just right and it blew the orange away. And I had the depth finder on and we looked down. It was 23 feet deep and we could see them down there. They were down there in the bottom of that, that hole, okay? Which I'll tell you what it was. Anyway, we went out there and told Buck it's real clear in there now. So he said, we just leave him alone, stay out there, drink some coffee, and when the wind comes up, we'll go in there. And we did. And with five of us casting, boy, it was on. We caught about 80 of them. And the biggest one was 11 pounds. So Buck caught that one. And uh, there was a lot of eights and sevens and sixes. And the pictures are all over the place. They're in a the great book and everything. And uh, what it was, we come to find out, it was a bug that was floating. So the Army Corps of Engineers anchored it down, and they anchored it right over a spring, 20-something feet deep. <laughs> I mean, they knew the spring was there. And uh, chances are there might have been another couple of spots like that, but we just needed that one. And we made a catch out of Popka, just stunned everybody.
was all, they put it on the front page of the Jacksonville Journal, not the sports section, the front page of the newspaper. <coughs> Tell them about the polluters, Jerry. <laughs> we weren't teaching spoon plugging. We, we were getting paid and we worked for Alton Boxport, uh, lid and paint, and we just take Regis paper metal. So we fished uh, the uh, St. John's River, <coughs> Lake Apopka, and Orange Lake, all lakes that were considered not so good. And they paid us to get the monkey off their back, and we did. With the help of Monroe Campbell's newspaper articles and things like that. That was the story of Lake Pop. Another question? <clears throat> Terry, how'd you get started with spoon plugging in the first place? Oh, I can thank Don Nichols for that. Uh, Don Nichols and I were good friends. And Mr. Perry needed someone to, uh, some younger person to work with him. And uh, so Mr. Nichols, he recommended me. So this is a story that John Bales likes me to tell. I, I was a tradesman, so I could uh, keep up my union card, and I could leave the business at any time and, and go fishing. And that's what I did. And uh, so I get a call from Mr. Perry, and he asked me to come to California, meet him in California. So I thought to myself, oh my gosh, gee whiz, I'm going to be in the boat with the master and everything else and have a real opportunity to fish for himself, you know. And uh, so I got on a plane and flew to uh, California and Buck picked me up at the airport. He took me over to where his camp was parked. He says, there's your rental car. Here's your money. Get what you need out of the camper. Here's the links I want you to map. Find some fish. When you do, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them what they said when you offered Buck to, to, to run the boat. Tell them what he said. <laughs> yeah, first I'll say this. Mr. Perry never ran the boat when I fished with him. I always ran the boat. One time on Lake, uh, he was, name excuse me right now, but it was one of the best lakes there. And uh, I asked him if he wanted to run the motor, and he says, what the heck do you think I hired you for? <laughs> think that uh, uh, you're disappointed in some of your catches because you don't make these great catches, uh, 33 bass on 33 casts or something like that. You go out and you get six or seven or eight, you figure, well, where's the 30 bass, you know? Well, every day it wasn't a banner day like that. Sometimes we had to wait two and three weeks for those fish to move good enough to get them on a cast because you couldn't take outdoor rider around and just Troll them around in the lake for eight hours, even if you caught 30. You had to get them on the cast. And so we had to wait many a time, you know. And uh, I mean, it was cold, and it was windy, and it was rainy, and it was hot, and it was <laughs> a little bit of everything, you know. And one year, I forget which year it was, maybe it was 68, 68 or 69. There's 310, 365 days in a year. I fished 310. Some guy said, boy, you can fish every day. You try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Perry never knew what Sunday meant. It was a day off. You know what I mean? And, uh, so you were out there from early in the morning until it got dark. And many times he was right there with you. You know. And uh, it's the kind of guy he was. I remember when we were up on, 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 on Hess Lake, and we got into them up there on Hess Lake. And I, I won't repeat the language because there's ladies there, you know. But he and I were really into them. And he says, them dirty, catch them till they quit. We just kept annihilating them. I was standing and bashed up over my ankles. Unfortunately, we had a photographer there, his wife, 
and Marjorie Perry, the first Mrs. Perry that passed away, and then Buck and I. So we kept a little, uh, 20 bass. I went on TV with them. The 20 bass is from Hess Lake in Michigan now, not Florida. Okay? Weighed 107 pounds. The stringer. Hess Lake is still good to this day. A lot of these guys in here will tell you. Okay? But it wasn't easy stuff. I mean, it was hard. It was hard. And uh, I, I'll tell you something else about him, the side of him that nobody really knows. I was down in Florida with him for nine months. Vic was down with me part of the time. And then Vic went home. Well, I was alone most of the time then. You know, Marjorie Perry was down there at the time. And uh, I was out at Dr. Lake, which is a, small, a pretty good sized lake. Off the, off the main channel, okay, and um, off to the side of the actual river. And uh, I see him on a pier waving to me, you know what I mean? I thought, it was in the summertime. I thought, gee whiz, what does he want? You know, maybe he wants to go fishing, you know. So I pull the boat up and he says, get that boat out of the water, get back to the motel, I got a surprise for you. So I thought, well, at least you're not mad at me. <laughs> I, uh, take the boat out of the water and follow him back to the hotel. And there's my wife and my two kids. Uh -huh. Thank you. They stayed there two months. <laughs> two months. During the summer. You earned it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. But he'd never tell you what he was doing. <laughs> he had no idea. There was a side of him, a human side that people just don't understand. You had to be a friend, you had to know. You know. But Terry, what do you think uh, Buck's most challenging lake was? Uh, he would, if he was here today, he would probably be able to answer that better than myself. Uh, <coughs> most of the lakes that we fished were only a challenge as far as waiting for the time to be right so we could get the outdoor writer up there. And we had no TV or nothing like that. The outdoor writer was our only outlet. You know, that was, that was what we had to do. You know. uh, the most challenging uh, lake, I think, that we had when he was with us was the St. John's River. That, I think, was the most challenging because it was so big. People think of a river like the Fox River or something like that. This thing was two miles across in places. I mean, it was huge, huge. The brackish water, salt water, fresh water. There was a lot of salt water fish in there. And we were able to find some bass, you know, to make it worthwhile. But the people didn't care whether we were bass or salt water fish. They didn't care. We were just catching a bunch of fish out there. And, of course, we kept dragging that Monroe Campbell out there that way. <laughs> He spent more time in the boat with us than he ever spent in his life, I think. And, but he did right by us. He, he rolled us some good stuff. Who discovered the spot on Lake Marie in Mr. the Fox Perry. Chain? Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry. They were out there. Uh, as Don Nichols was out there, Johnny Boy, and they had a couple of celebrities with them. I think these guys from Klein's apartment store. And then Buck, of course, had the head honcho guy there. And uh, they hadn't been doing too good, and Buck hit a pretty big bass. And they had three boats out there, so they kept maneuvering the boats until they got on the right spot. And I remember this was without depth finders, okay? They kept just using markers and stuff like that. And it was a spot that, uh, if you were to look at it, <laughs> you wouldn't think much of it. It broke from about 7 to 14 feet. Pretty sharp. Rocking shells on the edge. Then it just tapered off down to about 26 feet of water, okay? And um, like many of the structure situations in these natural lakes, they don't have an abrupt drop-off like John Bales mentioned, okay? They have more of a, a shallower break line, and then they run out of ways. But then they have another break line that if you have your depth finder set just right, you'll be able to find it. There won't be a, a real visible change of depth but it's a hard bottom, soft bottom transition area. And the only way you can find it is with the lure. Just keep moving out. You know what I mean? So, there may have been that there, but when those fish moved, 
you're anchoring about five feet of water, they, they come right up to that seven feet. Seven and down to about ten where it, you know, dropped and then moved to 14. I mean, it didn't look like much, but boy, there was a school of bass there that wouldn't quit. Since you've been talking about uh, uh, fishing without depth meters, how long did you fish and work for Buck without using a, a depth finder? When I worked for Buck, we had depth finders. Oh, okay. Okay. I fished from uh, 1958 or 59 to 1965 without a depth sound. 1965. And how did you go about uh, your mapping process? As if we using don't, the lures. With just the lures? Yeah, using the lures and markers. Is it true that when you were fishing up here, you were only using the, the uh, first three sizes? When I first started out, yeah. Yeah, I was... Uh, <laughs> I was getting a lot of fish out of them, you know, but I wasn't getting a lot of big bass. I was getting some, like on a 250. Then Don Nichols gave me a couple spots. Uh, one was a, uh, at the entrance of Pistake Bay. There's a bar across the middle. And he gave me some line sights and told me to put on the big lures, run out of deep water, run right up on it. Well, at that time, I was mostly contour trolling with the three small sizes and stuff like that. And uh, you couldn't miss it because Coon Island was right in front of him, and there was a tree and a window, a big, big window, and uh, put the tree on the right hand side of the window, and that was where the finger was, and run right up on it. So my dad and I were out there, and my dad suggested we give it a try, and came up on there with two 100s and had a double header on bass over five pounds. I lost mine, and he and dad landed his, and right there the light bulb went on. Right there, I knew what they were talking. About. And I, you know, I use the big lures too. You know. but, uh, who taught you how to school plug? Pardon? Who taught you how to school plug? Who introduced you to? Uh, I read Mr. Perry's material. I came home and, and uh, no, I, I should start further back than that. Uh, Don Nichols and Johnny Boy had been catching a bunch of fish out of the chain. And uh, I saw it in the newspaper when I got out of the Marines. And, uh, uh, I had fished out there all my life. My grandfather was on the resort up at Stakey Lake. And um, I knew we weren't catching fish like that. These guys were doing something, you know. And uh, so Tom McNally used to write for Chicago Tribune, famous guy. He and Don Nichols were good friends, fishing partners. They went to Canada and everything together. And, uh, he put Don Nichols' phone number in there, in an article with some pictures. Well, Nichols got a barrage of telephone calls. Some guys call him the liar, that, you know, things like that. Well, I was fortunate enough to call him and say the right thing. I didn't ask him what color lure or nothing like that. I just asked him, what are, what are you doing that I'm not doing? Just tell me what to do. And he told me about the plug and stuff like that. And of course, by this time, there was a big line at Klein's department store to go in there and buy spoon plugs. Well, I was one of the guys in that line that came out of the store and around the block and down the ways. You know, all we had then, there was no home study course. There was no green book. There was nothing but the little fold-out <coughs> that came in the package with the lure. And it always got folded uh, after a while right in the wrong spot, right where you couldn't read it anymore, you know. So I, I wound up taking a new one pasted it on a piece of cardboard, so I'd always have something to read, but that's all there was, you know, and uh, I, that's how I got started. <coughs> I didn't fish with, see, when was the first time I fished with Don Nichols? I think the first time I fished with Don Nichols was uh, talking to him on the phone from 1961. 1964 was the first time we fished together. I used to call him two or three times a year, and, you know, everybody has a mentor. I don't care what it is. Everybody's got a mentor. Well, he was mine. Okay? <clears throat> Coach. Yeah. Terry, when Buck was underwater, what would you say would have been his strongest attribute to fishing? Would it be the presentation of lures, the interpretation? <laughs> Something that John Bales did that you wouldn't believe. Do you see a deer? Do you see any wildlife? Do you see any minnows or bait fish swimming around in the water? He was an expert at the light conditions, naturally. But that type of thing, too. He was very observant, like John was talking about. You know, and he could tell when it was about to happen. 
I remember fishing with him here in Lake. He was in his 90s, and uh, he and a friend of mine were out on Lake Wiley down in North Carolina. And we had been killing him out there. His name is Ron Downhour. He's a pretty good spoon boy. And we've been slaughtering him out there. But we have Mr. Perry in the boat, and uh, it's slow. We're only catching small fish. We're getting frustrated. It's 104 degrees out there, you know, and uh, Mr. Perry's out there with us. He never complained, you know, and he knew we were getting upset. And uh, uh, he just said to me, boys, they're going to move. They're going to move. Sure enough, about 3.30, we got, we got 18, you know. The biggest one was six and three quarters. So he was just so observant of everything that was going on. That was his strong. Besides his knowledge about other things, too, you know. And uh, anybody that did all their mapping with spoon plugs with the lures themselves without a depth meter, you can imagine how good he was once he had a depth meter. And to him, he didn't use it that much, but he used it to map with because it was a big aid. It helped us do everything faster, just like it does all of you guys. But if you try to follow it, make controlling passes, Making a big mistake. Big mistake. Line sights, markers, there's nothing that can make up for that. GPS, nothing. Michael's got a GPS. Mike Moran, we came here following his GPS. They put us in the building across the street. <laughs> <laughs> Guys wondering about uh, making straight line trolling passage. You have to have line sights. Put a marker on. I, I have a line sight on Lake Wiley. There's a delta situation there with two humps, one on each side of the, the feeder cut. And for one of them, I put a, I have a line sight to put the marker down. I know what depth to put it in. And that's so when I come across it, it's pretty pretty long run. And I turn around and come back, I can look at that marker and I can be right in the right place. I'm not wandering around out there wondering if I'm going to get close enough. So nothing makes up for line sights and markers, for trolling passes or anchoring the boat. Nothing. Not a GPS. None of this new electrical gadgets, you know. It just isn't the same. It isn't the same. You just try it and you'll see. Guys trying to troll the weed line. Some guys can contour troll that weed line with a short line and stuff like that, but usually there's projections, sometimes there's turns in it. And you can't get back in and get out of there and come out and go around. The lures in the weeds all the time. Just concentrate. Instead of making one or two passes, make seven to cover the whole thing. Get the markers out. <coughs> one thing I want to comment about, Jim. The boats you guys had, Vic reminded me of that today. The boats you had, boats and motors, equipment. You should have seen the boats we fished out. <laughs> you always wonder if they're going to stay afloat. A lot of them were wooden ones, and the first thing you saw was a bale can. I'll tell you what, it's a good thing that was in there. You know, we never had good boats until we got up to Lake Wisconsin and Castle Rock. And they rented Starcrafts up there. And uh, we finally had a good boat to fit. But most of the rental boats, they were junk. They were junk. And Mr. Perry, we only had boats donated by Chrysler when we were in Florida. Other than that, every time we went somewhere, including Hess Lake, we had to rent a boat. We had to rent the boat. That's what we had to do. He insisted on that. Some of them, you were out of the water about that high. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever do any uh, uh, work in Louisiana? No. No. Terry, when you were uh, fishing Lake Wisconsin, um, there's that story about Buckler. He poured gas on the lure. Were you with him that time when the guy was speaking? That was speaking? Buck, that was me. That was <laughs> 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 they, they had a bunch of guys up there. And they were boiling the lures and putting them in coffee cans. Speak up, Terry. Speak 
up. Speed they were up. Boiling them, boiling the lures and putting them in coffee cans to take the man smell off them or something like that. <laughs> so I happened to be out there and um, I took a tip with me and dipped it in a gasoline can. And she made a phone pass and caught a wall. <laughs> so by this time, Mr. Binkelman and Mr. Perry were on the outs. They weren't getting along. <laughs> so in the fishing news, Binkelman's newspaper there, he called me a gas, uh, gas dunking fishing expert. Or <laughs> but to tell you, to tell you how, what these guys wanted, they wanted me to fly a flag on the boat I was in so that they would know where, how to get a hold of me out on the water. Okay. And should to tell you how they were, you wonder why they, anybody would boil lures and put them in a can. The guy says to me, he weighs me down, I was with my wife, and he says, my, my new Lawrence doesn't work. He says, can you help me? So I went over there, you know, and I says, uh, he showed me, it stays on zero, it was a green box. And I said, you have the transducer far enough down in the water. And he says, the what? Why did you plug in there? He says, oh, you mean that thing with the suction cup thing? That put I said, where's that? He says, at home. You wonder why the boiling and lures are put in the tank. Say, Terry, what's uh, Buck? had a lake mapped out. How did that, did it change his presentation of lures as far as the amount of casting he would perform as compared to when he first got into a new body of water? Did he become, did he cast more, anchor down on spots rather than, than troll initially? That's, as he a good, that's a good question. Well, that's I, why I asked him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew a good one would come out of you. <laughs> Once we had a lake worked out, we always went to the casting position first. <laughs> Especially dealing with the largemouth bass, okay? Always anchored first. And um, then we would troll and there's nothing else to break the monotony, you know, if the fish weren't moving. But there would also be northern pike in the lake, or maybe some walleyes or something like that. So we'd go to troll, but we always went to the cast first once the spots were worked out. How long would you sit on a spot? <coughs> Pardon me? How long would you sit on a spot? Who asked the eye? Oh, did you hear? Oh, probably, if there was two of us in the boat, maybe ten casts apiece. That's probably ten too many. <laughs> but, you know, just to make sure we fished it thorough. And we'd move to another casting position, probably wondering why, you know, knowing why they probably weren't going to be there either. But, that, again, to break the monotony, you know. Yes, sir. Tell them about how you met the town constable at Palmer Lake. Oh, <laughs> Vic, Vic and I were on Palmer Lake. And we were catching so many bass out there that they were getting mad at us, those Michigan people. They were really getting upset. So they called the constable, and Vic and I had a marker out there. And he came flying out there in a little boat, you know, a little motor on it. And, uh, he says, I'm going to find out what kind of fish collar you guys got on there. <laughs> Rolls it up, and we had two spark plugs hanging out there. <laughs> wait. That's all we had. You know? And uh, he was the most dazed looking guy you ever saw. <laughs> so I think it was Vic who told me, he said, would you please put that back where you got it from? You know? And uh, that's, that's a true story. <laughs> We had a lot of fun, Vic and I. We had a lot of fun. Terry, is there any advice that you would like give this group? Like, if there's one, one thing this group should concentrate on as we're on the water individually, is there something that that really stands out and is important to you, and that we should view in the same manner? Well, I think the mapping and interpretation is all very, very important also is being able to interpret the bottom conditions. Be very conscious of how the lure felt when you hit the bottom and got a strike. Be very conscious of the speed you were going when you get a strike so you can duplicate that. Now, like everybody, like all of us, you catch a big fish and you're kind of excited and 
you may not have the speed down right or something on the next pass because you're a little bit excited. But you concentrate. You have to concentrate. Every minute of time you're out there, you can't make half-hearted trolling passes. You can't say, doggone it, where's the fish? They're not moving. You've got to hang in there and concentrate. Just continue to concentrate on everything you're doing. And then what I would advise you to do, as soon as you get home, whether you're successful or whether you're unsuccessful, reread some of the things. <coughs> reread it again. And you'll be surprised how much you may have learned in a day's fishing. It's amazing. You think you know it, you think you understood something, but you really didn't. Okay? Terry, can I ask another question? Yeah. What what did you think, you know, as you fished throughout the years, what was your greatest challenge, you know, as a spoon plugger and trying to make a catch, other than fighting the, you know, the weather <coughs> conditions, because water conditions you could, you know, try and put to your advantage. But what was your greatest challenge? Uh, I would say when I first got started, being able to really understand what was going on, being able to picture what was down there. You know, so I would took the easy way out. I had three little lures. You know what I mean? I took the easy way out and got to a troll. But then, once I started to figure things out, I want to tell you something that really impressed me. When I finally got that depth finder in uh, 1965, and I fished mostly on the chain, on Channel Lake and Lake Catherine and Lake Marie and Pistakey Bay and then those structure situations look exactly like I thought they were. I don't mean somewhat. I mean exactly like I thought they were. And the thing I was most pleased with is my line sights for my trolling passes hardly changed at all. Shows you what you can do, but remember the hours and hours I put in out there. It's the only place I fish. You know. Uh, remember the last time we fished together? We were with Channel and Catherine, and we got like seven muskies? Yeah. We met Spence Petros coming out in the lake when we came in. Yeah. Tell the guys how we caught those, because that was a classic case of straight passes and hitting weak points. Yeah, we were we were on the, the big bar on the, uh, the east shore of Channel Lake. Yeah, I forget exactly what we did out there, but I know we uh, did. You're running big lures in Catherine and doing straight line passes and just hitting the weak points. And we right. Got seven must be that day. Right. And a couple of good ones too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was good in those days. I don't know how it is now, but it was really good in those days. Anybody else got any questions? Eric, just out of curiosity, what was the weirdest or strangest thing that ever happened when you and Buck were out on the water? Strangest thing ever happened. There was a lot of strange <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trying to think now, he kind of caught me there. <laughs> strangest thing that ever happened. Strangest thing you ever snagged off the bottom? Well, we got peach umbrellas and anchors and just about the same kind of things you guys get off the bottom. <laughs> you know. Where's your favorite place to fish? Well, that's changed over the years. I used to like Palmer Lake. Uh, of course, that's changed now. Bottom conditions have changed. Uh, I used to like Orange Lake in Florida. Uh, that was like shooting fish in a barrel out there, too. That's probably worth talking about. Yeah, Orange Lake was one of my favorites. And I like Lake Wiley down in North Carolina. I like Wiley a lot. And I like Rodez that's close to home down in North Carolina. Jerry, Vic and I them, went to Orange Lake. Jerry, tell them about your rifle sightings out on California when you took Mr. Perry out and put the white <laughs> That was on Lake Kachuma. Yeah, I had a, I had a uh, spot out there. I had a Delta hump on it. There was some construction going on. They were building a house. And I made the mistake of using a uh, outside toilet facility <laughs> for the, <laughs> one of my line sites. And when I got Mr. Perry out there talking about embarrassing, they moved it. You know what I mean? And so naturally we were off. We, fortunately, we found it again, but they had moved it. He got the biggest kick out of that today. Terry, how many 10 foot do 
he leaks out here. Yeah, that's what you said. How much 10 foot you think is out here? <laughs> the Orange Lake, Vicky and I went to Orange Lake, and that was another one. They were going to poison it. And a uh, pretty big lake, shallow, real shallow, monkey, everything else. The weeds came out to about three, four feet. Then it was nothing but muck and muck and muck, six, seven, eight, nine feet, gradual depth change. And as I'm coming across the, the, uh, the lake, I'm going to go to the other side, just about in the middle, I see a depth change. It goes down to 12 or 13 feet, and then back up to nine again. Well, then we ran it, and we found it. Was <coughs> okay? It had a monkey bottom, but a clean, marl type mud. And uh, Vic and I started trolling that slot. Boy, we annihilated him. Again, we went and got Monroe Campbell and dragged him out there. And that appeared in the paper. And and uh, this part is worth saying. We were in a motel. We were all done. The polluters had paid us. We'd done our job. Got the monkey off their back. And uh, this Orange Lake thing was a, was a crowning blow. Okay, believe me, it was. Mr. Perry had everything on film except Orange Lake, but he had a pop gun. And they had a big, uh, they had a big, uh, he had a big seminar going on while Vic and I were fishing. And uh, there was about 600 people there. So he asked these three guys from the conservation department if they wanted to see and say something. They said, no, we'll wait until you're done. Okay. Well, he showed the Bobka movie when the lights went back on, they were gone. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, this, uh, this thing on Orange Lake was the crowning blow, believe me. We were sitting in a motel and uh, ready to go home. Nothing to do anymore. It was all over with. We didn't stay around and teach schools or nothing like that. And uh, we get a call from this guy, Lee. He's a head guy in the Florida Conservation Department, wildlife, what they call it down there. He asked us how much we wanted to leave the state. <laughs> <laughs> he asked us what we wanted. I said to Vic, I said, we're in the money, pal. <laughs> I told Vic, there goes the money. <laughs> Here's what it was. The blacks did not need a fishing license to fish off the bank in Florida. So what they proposed to do, the two of them, to get a scheme together, they were going to charge the blacks 50 cents apiece for a uh, license to fish off the bank. And... Uh, they were going to use that money, and we were going to stay there and teach fishing schools. That's what we were going to do. They were running the same kind of thing that we've been running in the Midwest here, in the South. And uh, that fell through because the NAACP came down all over it. That was the end of the ball game right there. So we went home <laughs> without the money. <laughs> yeah. Say, Terry, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. When you guys cleared out, uh, whitewater, did the DNI give you some type of carte blanche to fish the lake out before they uh, no. cleaned it? No. Well, I thought the word was that they called up and said, you missed, <coughs> no. you missed one. No, no, no. Well, no. Well, they're back. No, they, uh, only tell the DNI, they didn't even know it was us. Uh, uh, they, they, whitewater is still good. Oh, yeah. Okay, whitewater is fine. Brown's Lake, they poisoned Brown's Lake. They did a lot of big mess. Okay? Well, my good friend Carl Maltz knew the conservation department up there in Wisconsin. And he called me up on the phone. And I was wondering what they did with the big bass that, uh, that they took out of Browns, which they intended to put back in Browns Lake after they poisoned it up and did whatever they were going to do. They moved them right down the road to a 120-some acre lake called Bonner's Lake. It had one deep hole in it. Great watercolor. Well, Carl told me, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> I went there and we annihilated them. <laughs> In those days, nobody knew nothing about catching your lease. You, know, you, just, you go down there and you keep catching your limit five or six times, and how many can there be? You know, two guys fishing together. So, Terry, earlier we were talking as a group about speed control, and but 
everybody has a different baseline, you know, whether it's the sound of the motor or, or the feel of the lure that they feel comfortable with. Where would you say your baseline of speed, like when you typically went out on the water, at what speed would you start your day? Well, that varies from one time of the year to another. Okay. You know, from the early season, you know, I, I, and you get into the warmer period, of course, and then it gets cold again. So that speed control varies. Now, on the troll, I do it mostly by feel. You understand what I mean? Like, if you were, if you were trolling at uh, 2.5 or 3 miles an hour on Lake Wiley in the summertime, when the surface temperature is 94.6 degrees and the water is only 28 feet deep in the channel, you'd be lucky if you had a strike. You might catch a catfish. You understand what I mean? I mean, you've got to be all of them, you know. But by the same token, if you're, if you're trolling for muskies in May up in the chain of lakes, speed control may be down 3, 3 and a half, and increase to 6 and a half or 7 during the season. As a warmer period comes on, most of the time in a pre-spawn or the bass, a fairly slow speed is required, and that's why the casting becomes so important. Like John was talking about at that particular time, okay? Working the insides of the weed lines with a jig and pig or something like that. Uh, use a silver buddy. Then a white by rattle traps when you silver buddy and cast it out and reel it in. Got the same lure. Not only that, it's an all-purpose lure. You can use it deep, you can use it shallow, you know, cast it out, reel it in, hop it, jump it, you know. And um, so, and then a lot of guys overlook these uh, these uh, minnow-type baits that are that are suspending minnow-type baits. That's the time to use it. That should be the fun time of the year. That pre-spawn, twitch it, let them stop. Twitch it, let them stop. Twitch it, let it stop. And many, many is the time when water temperatures in the 40s, the fish will hit that thing sitting still. Well, if you and Buck were on the water at the same time, would he typically be faster than you in, in his fishing, or equal to, or, or less as far as speed control? That would be hard to say. I, I think we'd both be pretty conscious of speed and changing okay. speeds, and you know, doing the best we could to okay. make sure we check what we could check. You know, faster in the shallows. A little slower as you move out, trying to bump the tips of fingers sticking out or delta humps or ridges or something that sticks up. Yeah, I've heard that, uh, and again, even in reading materials, that Buck, he, he practiced by getting lure into the water as quickly as possible and r keeping that lure in the water until he gets the... Oh, he'd drive you crazy. He'd come off the boat dock and you already got three or four places where you lose fish. He'd dump that 500 over the side and away he'd go, you know what I mean? He did that all the time. Drive me half nuts until he finally talked him into going out there and drive Jerry crazy too. <laughs> driving around the lake, yeah. driving around the lake. I said, "Oh, we came here to fish." <laughs> <laughs> he was looking for the place he wanted to fish. And that's that's something that when you go to a reservoir, like John Bale said, these natural lakes are they're a piece of cake. When you go to a reservoir, there's so many different types of structure situations that you have to know. You you have to know what you're looking. You know, you have to observe the shoreline terrain. When you see a feeder creek coming in, you go look for a delta ridge or delta humps on the feeder creek, okay, along the channel. You see a point of land. You see a steep shoreline. You know it's steep over there. You see a point of land here. There could be a wide sweeping bar right over here. You see a boat ramp, and you know they run tournaments on the lake. Excuse me. You know they run tournaments on the lake. Where do you think they release them bass? And if there's structure situations in the area, the bass ain't running back home again. They got no way to know how to get there. They go right to those structure situations. So some of them are like stocked. You understand what I mean? Okay, so you got to be aware of all that stuff. And uh, things like underwater islands or something like that that may not appear on a contour map, if you fish the lake enough, you'll find them. But if you're in a reservoir, you have to know what you're looking for. That's the big thing. You've got to know how to find it. And our <coughs> reservoir is down there. We've got highland features by the dam, lowland features at mid lake, and flatland features in the, in the headwaters. Then I talk to the guys about reservoirs. The guys call me up on the phone. 
I'm having trouble in this reservoir or that reservoir. What am I doing wrong? Have you been to the headwaters? Oh, no, the, the boat ramp by the dam is closer to my house. <laughs> <laughs> what does it say in the book? Go to the headwaters. Why haven't you gone there? What's the reason for it? See? So, those are the things that, in the reservoir that are so important and things that, like Phil, I said, concentrate on. Concentrate on the shoreline terrain. You know what you see. You got the left hand side, there's a bunch of cuts coming in. You know you could have some delta humps along there. Gotta go and check that out. You know, points of land sticking out and that. You're looking for that, you expect wide sweeping bars. You know, those are the kind of things that, if those are the all things you observe driving around the reservoir or looking at it from a bridge or crossing over the bridge and looking down. And the biggest thing I can say is find something to fish before you put a lure in the water. You know, when I first got there, there was no maps of road hiss and, and hickory. And the maps that they have now, there's nothing on there. They're terrible. They're not hot spot maps. They're fisher maps. And um, all I did was spend the first hour and a half going down one side in the headwaters, just checking everything and looking what it was like. Then I fished my way back down. And the, then the next time I went out there, I went to the other side, did the same thing. Yeah, two trips out there, you know what's going on. So, and a lot of it's observing the shoreline terrain. It's so important in a, in a reservoir. It's so important. Jerry, what about Mr. Perry and his love affair with St. James? Love huh? affair with what? His love affair with St. James. Remember, he went out there and he had to have a spot. Yeah, he had Vic and I out there, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he cut his eye teeth out there on Lake James when he was a kid, and his dad had built them. I guess it was a resort, Jerry. Oh, well, it was, uh, they called it the lodge, but it was, it was some, several businessmen who had gone together. Uh, his daddy was a builder, and he built the kids in the wild stayed there all summer, and the husband came up on the weekend. Jerry was out there with Buck, and they hit it right. The water color was good. They had another couple out there with them, and they caught a bunch of smallmouth and stuff like that. Well, when we went there with Buck, it was crystal clear. I mean, crystal clear. And it was put in by the dam where the Linville arm was this way, and the Catawba arm was that way. And um, it was just real clear. And uh, there was a hundred and, I don't know, 135 or 150 feet deep at the dam. And the brake line going in the channel was at 55 feet. And as you move further downstream, the brake line would go to 47 feet, then 42 feet, then 37 feet. Then you'd finally get some reachable stuff as you got a little bit further. That was a little easier to reach, even with wire line. Then he took us up to Linville line, which he liked. And uh, it was so clear, I put an anchor down in 18 feet of water, and I could see the anchor rope going all the way down to the black anchor sitting on the bottom. Needless to say, we didn't go back there. That's, uh, and, uh, you know, he grew he, from the time he was five years old till he was 15, he spent his summers there. And the observations that he made, his dad was a great hunter too, and he went with his dad all the time hunting. He observed the animals and how they reacted and all. He made all his observations and formed his theories about fish. On that jank, he had the clear arm with Lindell, and then he had the dingy arm with Catawba. He had two different waters coming in, and he fished as a kid with his dad, and he made this observation. And that's really where he formed his theories of fishing. That was the, that was the base of it. I know he loved that place. He did. He did. Oh, you said dingy arm on a Catawba? <laughs> yeah, it was it must have been there at the right time. <laughs> His dad, uh, one, uh, one of the guys that fished with his dad was, uh, he came to Chicago to, uh, to a furniture uh, show, and he bought the first artificial lure that Buffett had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And his dad went fishing up uh, sometime in March, up, up that uh, Catawba side, and made a catch of like, oh gosh, I don't, you've seen the picture, but it was a, the biggest catch that they'd seen. But that was, it was... Uh, but it was a muddy bank, you know. You probably remember the details of him talking about it more. Yeah, we were up there. We were yeah, all the way oh up yeah, there. You know, we always we always had to go visit that 
that's right. And we ran up there. That was like a religious spot. Yes, yes. <laughs> now we went, uh, Rocky Bridges, my father-in-law and I, we went all the way to Marion ah. and found some watercolor. We caught some nice smallmouth up there, but we had watercolor up there. You know, and that, that, that's how far we went, all the way to Marion, which is at least another, almost another hour past, uh, you know. Anybody else have any questions? I have one. What do you see as the future of spoon plugging? Future is going play. Well, there's not enough young faces. Okay? Not enough young faces. Look around here. Uh, how many do you see? Okay? It's hard for us to, to fight the TV people and all the stuff that you see on TV. And <clears throat> the young people today. The bass boat appeals to them, and the speed, and you know that's half the thing, and cranking that thing up and flying. And if you if you tell them that's not the right thing to do, well, all the pros do it, and then they turn right around. And if you criticize them, they'll turn right around and say, "If you guys are really that good, how come you're not on TV?" <laughs> <coughs> See, Buck would never prostitute himself or spoon plug it. I could tell you, I could tell you some of the things that he did. I didn't agree with him, but perhaps he was right in the long run. Mercury Motors offered to, uh, if he would, if he would, uh, what's the word, Jerry? Uh, endorse. Yes. Endorse. endorse. Yeah. They would build a 9.8 motor, Buck Perry spoon plugger on it, and they would have a boat built, Buck Perry spoon plugger. He refused. Now they would have done all the advertising, all the advertising, everything. It wouldn't have cost him a dime. Besides, Vic and I would have some good boats to run. <laughs> <laughs> so, way, he would not prostitute himself. The only time I ever seen him really endorse something was the Garcia Ambassador 5000 reel. And he did that because he thought it would be a great tool for the spoon players. That's why in his material he mentions it. And what you need to do is get Steve to develop a computer program, a computer game, and that's the way you're going to get the younger people. <laughs> well, Mrs. Perry and Steve, and they got together on that. John Bales and I are just two people that could use as tools. <laughs> Hopefully we can make it nice. How about a big hand for... to uh, say anything. You've been sitting there quiet all day.
it's going to put something out there that is what we want. I mean, this is the way Buck would want it. Uh, this is the way uh, we don't have to worry about somebody changing it here or there or the other because we'll have a basis. So I think this is going to be really important. And just everybody, I just want to say thank you. For being a spoon plugger, Buck would be proud of y'all. <laughs>